Hi, and welcome to episode two of Swim for Land. Well, how you doing? Thank you for the reaction to last week's episode with Janie Godley. I was blown away by the fact that people uh, took the time to watch and to listen and to respond and to share their own stories with me and with Janie. Uh, we both got a really good reaction from it. Um, and uh, it's, it's helped me because the more people talk about it and the more exchanges I have with people, the, the easier I find it to talk about. I wanted to talk this week about anxiety. Now, anxiety for me is something that I didn't understand until I started suffering from it. Panic attacks, anxiety that creeps up, and that kind of anxiety that bubbles under and is there all the time, and all it takes is something to come along and go, eat, and to jag it up. Um, I've suffered from panic attacks, and... Uh, a sort of an anxiety disorder that I'm not entirely sure what the name is, but it is there. And this week has been particularly bad for it. Um, I'm okay at the moment, but I've had very restless sleeps and I have wakened up in a bit of a state and had to get up, watch Tom and Jerry, um, and do all the things that I have to do to be able to calm down again. Now, next week's guest is New York author Drew Linsalata, who, whose book I'm reading at the moment is called The Anxious Truth, and it is about the actual mechanics of what happens to you when you have anxiety and an anxiety attack. So interesting, and it's really, really helped me this summer um, when I had a four-day anxiety episode, let's call it an episode, Drew helped me through that and that's why I've become interested in what he talks about. But that is for next week. This week's guest is Greg McHugh, who is a well-known actor and writer and comedian. He plays Gary Tank Commander. He's in uh, the A-list. It's not the A-list, it's the A-word. I'm getting my actors mixed up. And uh, Fresh Meat, he's, he's a well-known person and he is the most unlike his character that you'll ever meet. He's nothing like Gary Tank Commander. He is focused, he is clever, and he's a very exciting person to work with. I've worked with him quite a lot. Uh, the last major thing we did was uh, the, the stage version of Gary Tank Commander at, uh, Commander at the, Ar not the Armadillo. I'm off my head tonight. Uh, at the, what is it? The big thing in Glasgow. The Hydro. What is wrong with me? Uh, and, Gar and Greg and I wrote a song together for that and we did some music and uh, he's always somebody that's intrigued me because um, I think he's a very talented, very clever person, but he also is quite open about talking about mental health issues. And he's been quite the advocate the past couple of years. That's why I wanted to get him on to talk because I wanted to hear his story and I thought it was good to get uh, you guys to listen to him as well. So without further ado, let's get to it. It's Greg McHugh. <laughs> Greg, how are you? I'm well, Tom. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm all right. I'm I'm not too bad. Thanks for coming on and doing this. I just want to uh, I want to normalise talking about mental health because uh, for a long time I think it's been it's it's almost felt as if it's something to be ashamed of. And for me personally, I always worry that I'm never going to get a job again if I say that I'm not well because you get I worry about getting a reputation of being unstable. When in actual fact, I think things are changing now, um, that it's it's now recognised as a proper thing. And yeah, I, I, I know we did a thing uh, recently. The reason why I, I wanted to ask you on to, to talk about this was we did a thing for Ross recently, Ross Owen, um, where it was kind of sound bites of, of people talking about it. And it, it just seems refreshing to to start a conversation about it. And that's what I want to do in here without being, without being uh, sad about it, because you always think about it as yeah. being sad. 
Yeah, I, suppose, I think you're right. I don't, we just don't have the language that allows you to casually talk about it, you know, a bit like the broken leg analogy or the, or the broken wrist or whatever it is, that the minute you mention mental health, <laughs> instantly people, people are like, oh, you mean you're mental? You know, it's always, <laughs> yes. the, it's always the negative connotation. It's always, oh, my God, I, I better run away from this guy. He's got mental health issues. And that's something that, yeah, we've demonized. We've demonized the language. So, you know, we can talk about other health issues and we're encouraged to. And I, I think you're right. I think things are changing. But absolutely, having a spell of where you don't feel great mentally is, is, not, is, is not the end of your life. It's what most people go through, I think. Well, I think that's what keeps you in in the prison of your own head is that you you worry about what people are going to think, and that mm-hmm. actually exacerbates what you're going through. That actually makes things worse. Um, I overthink things, and I over uh, any time I'm going in to do a job, I start worst case scenario, and yeah, <laughs> I, thought, well, I, hope I, don't circle, off- I hope I don't offend somebody. I hope I don't say the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, and then after it, I come home and I replay everything that's happened. And I just start going, oh, no. And then, then I start wor- worrying that I've offended somebody. It's, it's a very strange situation that I've got to deal with. But um, do you think that, that, that people have become... What do you think is the key to people giving themselves permission to talk about this kind of stuff? Um, I, I think the key is, is, as you're trying to do now, is trying to normalise the discussion about what you know, most people go through. So so the key to give yourself permission is often reflected in how other people are talking about it. So there's encouragement. Um, You know, we see it generally, we see it through schemes. I've I've had experience of working with um, Sam H, uh, Scottish Association of Mental Health. um, Oh, yeah, yeah. In the past, who are brilliant, are trying to encourage, um, particularly, it's not just men, but men of a certain age who have perhaps not been... um, brought up around the kind of openness that is hopefully starting to come through now because I think younger men are are, are 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 good at it. But in terms of giving yourself permission, I think it's just saying or or anyone, any man, any person, any background saying, I it's cool, it's cool to talk about it. It's, if you're feeling rubbish, you know, encouraging each other, men and women, to to really um just say it. Just literally say it out loud, keeping it internally um, as you were saying, maybe exacerbates the problem, and I don't have all the answers, but I think just encouraging, particularly, I'd say, men of, of you know my age and, and, and your age, like forties, to to just be to feel comfortable because it's normal. <laughs> 40, 40s in the rear view mirror for me, mate. Quite a way back. <laughs> Are you? Oh, you're looking amazing. Ah oh, man, no, I've aged about twenty-five years in the past eight months. Um, do you think that? Yeah. I think that something that I've found, Greg, is that in the past few months, because of this bizarre, weird, and this word that keeps being used, unprecedented situation we've been in. Yeah, I think it's almost held a magnifying glass up to mental health issues, and we've been, we've had no choice. It's almost as if we've been cornered into. I, it happened to me this summer. I, I, I suffered from, from quite bad depression and anxiety a few years ago, and I kind of spoke about it quite a lot back then to mixed reactions. It, it, it was a, oh, really? a, a couple of, yeah, a couple of people had said to me, thank goodness you stopped talking about all that. But we're worried. And I'm like, ah. Oh. But this year, um, and I thought I'd conquered it. I thought, uh, well, you know, I don't suffer from that anymore. I'm fine. I'm absolutely yeah. fine. This year it came back with an absolute vengeance in the summer. There was one day where I woke up and I just couldn't move. I just couldn't really? get out. Yeah, I just couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't open my eyes. Um, and it, I, I had enough. I don't know. I had enough to get the phone up and phone the doctor. And 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 they they got me a prescription out. And I, I thought I, I thought this was a way. I thought I was cured. And then. Following that, after a couple of weeks of gradually getting out of that, in came the anxiety again. Mm-hmm. And it just culminated in what I would probably describe as a breakdown. Um, I always think of a breakdown as sitting in a corner, rocking back and forward. And, and, and it's not. It's For me, the anxiety breakdown in the summer was not being able to sit down for four days because it was wow. too... And I had uh, I reached out to a, a New York author called Drew Lynn Slatter who taught me a really, really important thing. He said, stop trying to fight the anxiety. Just sit down and mm-hmm. let it happen because it will wash over you. It will pass. Fighting it intensifies it and, and, yeah. and 
gets the grip. And my the biggest uh, thing that I found was that as soon as I started asking for help and talking about it and somebody else would come out of the woodwork and go, me too, yeah, I'm struggling. Totally. And because people this year have maybe been encountering this for the first time, we're all giving each other permission to talk about it. So it's, it's, yeah. like, it's almost like we're passing it on to each other and having each other's backs. Have you found Absolutely. that? You, I mean, you've, you've, got, you've got Katie and the kids now and everything and stuff, so you're not... You're not on your own like, like me and stuck in that third day after day. But it- day after day. But well, no, I do. Have, and I'm very, I'm very happy and lucky to have a very supportive wife and, and two very full of life um, kids. But, but I've not been immune at all of, of, yeah. of anxiety this year. And of course, the, the natural anxieties that we, we, so many people will have had to do with work and work being stopped or cancelled or furloughed. And I think during the lockdown as well, and I'll chat a wee bit about, I was open about uh, a couple of years ago, I had a, a bad period of, of uh, what, what I think was pretty severe anxiety. And it's to do with uncertainty. Yeah. And I remember speaking, I was, I, had an, I interviewed the Samaritans about a project, about a men, mental health project. And uncertainty is one of the greatest kind of catalysts for anxiety. And I don't think really you could go through 2020 the year of the the pandemic without feeling some level because the uncertainty levels were so high at the start and they're still uncertain to hopefully a slightly lesser degree as we go into next year but no I've not been immune to that at all and that's with a family and with kids and distractions so I totally get where you're coming from that well I guess yeah you've got got extra you've, you've got extra worries I guess I've only got to worry about myself and the cats you know, you've got Aye, your but kids. As you're and... saying, though, it's, it, it, the distraction or the people opening up around you or me being able to say to my wife in a room, oh, my goodness, what's going on? How, you know, all the work's disappearing. Is it going to be disappearing forever? You know, the, the craziness with the, the, the furlough system, trying to work all that out, is that I, at least I've got someone in a room to chat to and to, for people on their own, it, it must be it must be more difficult and um you know, I think that's why, you know, you starting this, these kind of discussions is it's so important is just to, to encourage everyone, whether they've got a family and kids or whether they're on their own in a flat that no one is immune. I don't think anyone is. I quite like my own company anyway. It's not been that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like the two metre yeah. distance. I'm like, I'll, I'll, I know, I'll cope with that. that. I know, yeah. That. That's lovely. Um, so, Greg, I mean, you mentioned there that you've had, uh, you've had dealings, dealings, mm. With uh, mm. with mental health in the past, can you tell us a wee? Us, it's just me. Can you tell me a wee bit about that? Well, yeah, because actually, uh, you were partly responsible, not in a real way. I mean, what? That's a joke, but um, a lot of people say we... that after working with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the lead up to when we did uh, Tank Commander at the Hydro, uh, that year was a was a was a kind of a, a crazy year for me when I look back at it and I kind of try and fathom how I managed to or, or wanted to try and fit in so much so basically uh, 2016 broke my ankle we had a baby we moved house uh, I took yeah. on the hydro I was writing the hydro show I was across every element of production and before that I'd gone from tank commander sitcom to fresh meat and I had not stopped really for years literally one project after the other and then taking on this huge project on the year of having a, a you know, first child and uh, underestimating the impact that would have on me. So I had all these multiple things happening. And then after the show at the Hydro, which, which went well and couldn't have been kind of, I couldn't have been happier with what we did and what you did and then what we achieved. <laughs> uh, it was an, a, but then I hit a huge wall right after the show. And, every, and people often say, oh, yeah, you do a big show and then you feel down after it. Well, this was a different level of feeling uh, down. And I could, the, the thing that really hit me was I didn't understand. I couldn't rationally work out why I felt the way I felt and that I found terrifying I found it terrifying at the time and I went to see uh, somebody and, and got some help um, with and you know um, again with my wife being so supportive and saying don't worry about this let it happen and go and chat to someone and I did um, but yes that was after a successful very successful year but it just shows that even after all that it, it, I'd worked too hard I had I'd got too involved um, and I'd let stuff build and build and build. And that's what happened to me um, 
and I think I learned a, a huge amount from it. I think it's, uh, I think you forget as well, because I've done a few of these at the Hydro now, and I think you mm. forget the pressure that is the thought of 14,000 people sitting there going, make me laugh. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that, at the time, you're, 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 <laughs> I know, especially, things, yeah. and it's Glasgow, yeah. you know, I mean, they're not going to, yeah. they're not going to pretend to like you. So uh, I think that, that there's a build up that you ignore. I always mm -hmm. find that if I'm working hard on something, I'm so focused on it. And then it gets to the end and it stops. And then you start replaying all the stuff. And then you start, yeah. all the stuff you've Absolutely. been keeping down starts to resurface. And for me, sometimes I can just shut down after that. And yeah. that's, that's when it's hitting a brick wall. And it's not the same as panto flu or the downer no. after you for the show. When you've invested so much, like what you were doing with, with Gary Tank Live, it was, as you said, you were, you were right in amongst it. it was your show it was your, it was your baby yeah. so you had the responsibility of if if this is shite nobody's it's my fault and it, thankfully it yeah. was it was brilliant and we wrote a cracking song by the way that was a we did song. write a cracking song we, we did write we, a, we cracking a cracking song, song. It, was, it was brilliant and i loved it but you see tom it's funny you say that because actually in the process of, of loving things i suppose what i'm trying to say is is the mental health connection with having a great period in your life for instance it's not mental health isn't always about Oh, everything's gone wrong in, in my life or, or there's of course you know episodes can lead to um you know negative times in your life can lead to mental health issues but also even in in good times that taught me a valuable lesson of your brain doesn't work in the way that you'd kind of think automatically it's going to um despite doing that show and us, us having a great time and the rehearsal today being great um and i know this is kind of weird because i'm not looking for sympathy for having done what i did what i'm trying to say is even in that instance, I hit a wall that I did not understand. I yeah. didn't understand why I felt like I did after it. Um, that's, and that's the frightening in... thing for me, Greg, because when it, when it happened this time, I had had experience of it. So I kind uh -huh. of knew the first time it happened, it's the uncertainty that makes it worse. And that comes from people not discussing it. That comes from the... Yeah. The, the keep it a secret thing that, that is a generational thing. It was a real, the way I was brought up, I mean, my mother, I think, had problems, but it was never, you know, it was never a diagnosis or something you would ever talk about or admit. Totally. But, but now people are going, I, I don't know what's going on. And in the past, it would have been, shh, you'll end up in the yeah. nut house. Whereas now it's like there's a path out. And I think we're all finding the path out together this year, I guess, totally. because it, my experience with 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 going to the doctors and stuff has been wonderful, but there were things that I think need really, really rethought. You know, I was on a mm -hmm. six month waiting list for help, and in that six months, it wasn't Disneyland. But yeah, I, I, I think, think you're that the, right. The, yeah, that is the key. It's, it's giving each other the it's the uncertainty that drives it worse and when you hear somebody else saying a thing that has been pulling your brain down into hell basically mm -hmm. somebody else goes oh i feel that too you go oh right i'm not yeah i'm not an alien absolutely i'm not and, and the other thing is that you know the advice from the author you say let it wash over you this will pass is that i i absolutely agree with that there'll be waves of days and you'll you know as, as you've explained where you feel you can't I can't get through today or I just can't face getting up again. But, yeah. but that will pass. And the more you share, the more that you, if it's reaching out for help or if it's having a chat with a buddy, if it is writing your feelings down, I found, I found that helped me um, at, at stages as well of when I was feeling good or bad. Um, and these feelings, and I know this is different from clinical perhaps depression but these feelings are not forever and you 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 will get through it and you can manage it and, it and you can come through it the hardest part about that is that when you're in it you don't believe people when they tell you that because yeah, it feels no. impossible it's not it helpful feels, <laughs> it's sort of it, you need to hear it but it doesn't help in that moment because you just go mm -hmm. no not me i'm the exception i'm stuck here because i've yeah. not sat down for four days yeah. And uh, it was it was actually Drew, the author, that said to me, sit down and let it happen. Just let it wash over you. And within uh, a day or two, it began to ease. And I yeah. started finding a path out of it. But what I'd like to move on to now, Greg, is, is um, mm. 
the, one of the things that has really kept me going through this is humor and, and, and finding and being able to laugh at this because um, I, I, if I take this too seriously and get too bogged down in it, I'm screwed. Yeah. One of the things that has really, really kept me going is Janie Godley's voiceovers every day. With, uh, oh. the, it is just, and I think that's really kept Scotland. Uh, it, it's just made us, we've got to laugh at ourselves. In yeah. Scotland, anyway, we've got to take the piss, and I think it is just—it's just—it's it, channeled into something that I think we needed. And I think you know, you do that with with Gary. You know, Gary, that was let's make a sitcom about it being at war in Iraq. You know, yeah. it's finding humour in the darkest of situations. Um, how I did think, you? How did you? What, what did you? Because I remember when Gary Tank Commander started, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. It was it was genuinely like uh, you plonked the least uh, the least army like guy in the middle of the army in the middle of all this fear and darkness, and he was talking <laughs> about somebody's jacket. You know that that I think that is one of the most important. That's why I want this kind of podcast to be a laugh rather than yeah. than, than than you know how important is it? Do you think to find to be able to turn it around and go? <laughs> well, I mean it's it. it it's this it's this weird phase we're in where we're chatting about mental health and it's an it's an obvious issue and the stats are pretty bleak, right? Yes. A bit like with Gary in the army, when I was doing that show, the horrific nature of what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of um uh, casualties, civilian soldiers was very bleak. But I absolutely agree with you that within the bleakness you either get deeper, deeper, deeper into the bleakness or you try and get some perspective of the comedy. So Janie's voiceovers have kind of saved the nation in terms of she's communicating a new message, but it's still the message, actually. She's still, she's very cleverly done these voiceovers, yeah. which are, A, very, very funny. I mean, just just howling. And people <laughs> just, every single one, there's not been a weak one. She's had, oh, she's a brilliant writer and a great performer. But you need that to also reflect some of what's going on. So it's mm -hmm. funny, but it's reflective and it's real because she's not actually changing all the message of the, the voiceover. She's, she translating. she's, she's translating. translating into funny jokes on top of the message. And hopefully with Tank Commander, it was a different kettle of fish, but Gary was about, let's, not, not, not in a fundamental way, but actually let's look at the human characteristics of um, an unlikely hero in the army who's full of confidence. Let's look at the soldiers as... as slightly more human individuals than just a set of statistics. And a bit yeah. like in COVID, if you were to just look at statistics, just look at uh, rates of infection or re, you know, peaks and troughs and graphs, is we need to find a way out of that. And, and you know, that, that is and it's part of our cultural DNA, isn't it? It always has been that the Scots are always very good at reflective humour. Um, yeah. And do you know what? That, that saves people. It absolutely saves people. Absolutely. Did you get um, did you get reactions from people in the armed forces to Gary? Because I know a lot of the Scott Squad people get policemen going, "You've been uh, following us." Yeah. Well, Gary, I was so lucky. I mean, we were all nervous when it first went out. Although I wasn't, because I kind of I knew what I was saying in it, and the people around some individuals were nervous and broadcasters. And actually, you and Angus, who commissioned the show, fair play to him back in the day. We had an emergency meeting before it was due to go out. And I thought, uh, you know, because the buck would fall with him that he might have said, no, we're not going to put it out. And he did. He went, no, I believe in this. And so as a result, the army, God, I had a few, so many funny moments in the street. Uh, people who'd been in the army or, or were in the army, but in civvies. Um, I had a guy, I remember going for a, a, a pee in Ashton Lane in, in one of the boozers there. And this guy beside me, as I was doing a, as I was doing a pee, he said, yeah, Gary, thank you, man, though. I was like, uh, well, how do you play this? He went, I'm in the army. And I was like, oh, God, right. And then I was like, all right, are you? And he went, aye. He says, he goes, I, I, I fucking love it. But there's, there's, no, there's no way you've gone dark enough. You could have gone a lot darker than you did, but well done. Pats me in the back. I'm not joking. I'm like shaking. And you're right. I'm going, oh, my God. Um, and then thankfully, oh, it was absolutely terrifying. You know, there's not more exposing position to be in, but. Um, and then I did a soldier, I did a tank commander's, uh, well, he wasn't, his best man was a tank commander, but I did a, a soldier's wedding and 
I performed uh, after his wedding and that was like an absolute honour to do. And then the armed forces got behind the show as well. So I think they understood, you know, they gave us locations and helped us with equipment and all the rest of it. So I think they understood what I was trying to do was highlight that soldiers going to war and being told what to do are, are still humans. They are just under the power of, of governments and uh, and at Dara. That's the line, yeah. That's the yeah. Oh, that's that. You know, that you're a more vulnerable position to get challenged by a guy oh. when you're you've got your bobby in your hand. So well, <laughs> that, that is it. It was. Uh, it was. I'll always remember that moment because the show just it wasn't long out. So by a couple of series in, I knew we were fairly safe. But at that point, I did nothing was safe, including my um, potent uh, biological parts. Yeah, because people, people. I mean, Jen, the thing that I found surprising when I was in River City was some people think it's real. Some people wow. think you're actually, you know, some people will think you're actually Gary. And then when you open your mouth and you speak normally, they'll be like that. So oh, I mean, I've had I had, that, yeah. yeah. I got slapped in the face in George Square by a woman. No. Um, yeah, for marrying Tatiana instead of Iona in River City. Wow, like, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, and I had to just go, oh, I'm sorry. Because yeah. she, she thought it was real. She believed it. But anyway, listen. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to, I'd like to talk about, how so when you had that after Gary Tank Commander live, mm. how did you get out of that? What, 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 was, what did you do to, did you do anything proactive to get out of it or did it just pass on its own? Well, no, I went to see a therapist and I'll be totally open here that I, I paid to go and see someone because I didn't feel I could wait, as you're saying, for a six-month six waiting months. list. Yeah. And I was in a very privileged position where, at that point, uh, I could afford to see someone for a couple of months. And so I went and told this therapist how I felt um, and all the things that kind of led up to how I felt. And she, she actually said, I always remember the first session, she said, um, if you'd come to me with one of these quite big life events, I would understand why you're here. You've just listed five pretty life, you know, uh, influencing uh, events. Um, so I did. I, I paid for. I paid to go and see someone because I had to, uh, or I felt I had to at that stage. And then after that, she gave me tools of kind of CBT therapy to think about and and little techniques that I still use. Um, I'll tell you one thing. I don't know if anyone else has ever had this, but I asked the therapist this at the end of one of my sessions. I said to her, can I ask you something silly? And she went, yeah, of course. I said, when I felt my most anxious, my arms stiffen up, and I've woken up with stiff arms, and I, and I said, is this something different? And she just looked at me, and she said, That's a, that is actually quite a classic symptom of fight or flight mode. When you're tensing your arms, the oxygen levels in your arms change, and you get a stiffness sensation as the CO2 comes in, as if you're going to fight or flight. Wow. And knowing that, honestly, knowing that on its own, because it had been happening for ages, it been happening for years, this kind of tension in my arms and feeling really funny. Once she said that to me, and, I, and then the next time it happened, I was like, a bit like your, your uh, you know, author mate saying, let it wash, that will go, the tension will go. But just knowing that that was a symptom that wasn't to do with anything else, it was to do with a chemical reaction in your body. So you're not being able to sit down that might be a bit of the fight or flight, the tension, the standing up, the, you know, these, these things are connected. That's why it's so odd sometimes when we separate mental health. It can be it's physical and mental, I think. Um, I love that stuff. I love when you get an answer to a thing that you think you've the only person in the world that's ever had, or you think it's totally. some horrific thing, and they go, no, that's actually, and then they give you a Latin name, or they say, no, that's <laughs> a thing that, that, that's just, it's like... Fight that's a, absolutely. I know, but, it's, but because nobody talks about it, you never hear about it. That's the problem. You never so hear about it. So somebody might be watching this and going, I get stiff arms. They, they might do. I mean, yeah, they, and it made sense to me. The, the fight or flight, the anxiety, the kind of being on edge and, and overworking is going to feed into your body. It's going to make you physically feel rubbish. It's going to make you extra tired because you're tensing and, and the chemical levels are different. That made sense to me. And therefore, I could kind of compute certain things. After that, your brain's a very complicated, difficult thing, obviously. But that was just one element that, that I always remember going, oh, thank God I asked that. Thank God I asked that question that I thought was 
completely unrelated to anything. Um, mm-hmm. So that was a great therapist I saw. And so she gave me tools to cope. And I also stepped back from work, um, which I kind of I had I had to just take a break. And that I took a few months of uh, allowing myself. Um, you know, again, I know it's not easy for folk, and and I was lucky that I could do that at the time. But um, yeah, so I took a bit of a break. Good stuff. So the CBT stuff, is that something that uh, you would recommend? Because I've never tried that. A lot of people talk to me about it, but I've never actually tried it. Well, it, it, I've always been, I don't know how, how you are, as an individual, I'm, I'm a very visual, I'm visual based. I just, that's, I think when I write, I think of um, images. And mm-hmm. CBT for me and, the, and the, the practices she gave me were kind of visual representations. She talked about, um, you know, the tiger and the bushes fear of you thinking there's something lurking there and actually that's just a figment of your imagination that there's no threat to yourself there's no threat mm-hmm. in the bushes you create that so she she just made me think about the, um, the kind of the disappearance of that animal and things like that so for me i know it sounds nuts but these are things that just doesn't help me was um was images so that cbt side of it um and water flowing over you as anxiety as going away so images helped me so yeah. I, I had a huge benefit from that, I've got to say. Yeah, because they talk about the black dog at the door or the wolf at the door. And all kind of, uh-huh. And I, I do, I feel like that. I feel as if I'm constantly mm-hmm. waiting on something awful happening, catastrophizing, yeah. you know, totally. thinking worst case scenario. And 99.999% of the time, it's all right. Maybe, you know, but it's just... So just to, to finish up, Greg... Um, yeah, yeah. I've been uh, very aware of this in the past few months that uh, there's going to be a, there's going to be I don't want to say a tsunami of mental health problems, but it's going to be like that coming out of this um, mm-hmm. because people have people have experienced a, a, a very surreal situation this year, and perhaps they've been locked up or whatever, and, and they've experienced uh, anxiety and depression for the first time, and I think that the system in place is going to struggle struggle to cope so I think it's coming down to us as individuals to start looking out for each other how can we do yeah. that how can we be proactive in our uh, immediate communities about doing this because none of us are qualified all we can do is say how we feel no I, I, the, 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 there's often things doing the rounds um on social media but a few things that stood out for me is Ask a confident buddy how they're doing. Ask a non-confident buddy how they're doing. Ask a normal person how are you doing. And I think that's the first step is just really taking the t- kind of the kind of the time, the proper time, um, try and start a conversation. You know, kind of meaning how are you, how are you getting on, and maybe mm-hmm. just consistently keeping that up. I've got a few buddies, and we phone each other regularly. You know, so yeah. once a week I'll speak to a couple of friends and we'll be like, How how are you? How are you doing? Talk to me yeah. about what you're doing. And I think that's that's really a fundamental of this is is if you can reach out and if you're on your own and you feel isolated is in whatever way you can, maybe reaching out for people, texting doesn't always have to be a phone conversation or, or texting a friend and asking asking them how they are, or actually saying to a friend you're around for a for a chat i mean i'm not a doctor but i suppose it's what we're seeing here is looking out for each other is is just helping the discussion yeah greg you're an angel thank you thank you greg uh, next week's guest as i said is drew linsalata who is a new york author whose book I'm really enjoying at the moment. And uh, we're going to get a good old chat with him next week. So until then, stay safe and keep the heat.